Nick Ferrari at Breakfast on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 7.49 is the time. Come back to our conversation about those demonstrations across much of the United States in the wake of the Roe v. Wade ruling. But let's get into events in the United Kingdom. Well, perhaps take you elsewhere. Upon sadly now, Ukraine, of course, is known as a place for unjustified uh, attempted invasion by Russia, bombing war uh, and all the aftermath and horrors of that. But, but you should be aware, it was the bread basket of Europe I have here supplying 10% of the world's wheat, up to 17% of the world's maize, and half, half, of the world's sunflower oil. Well, sadly, many of these products and others now are at risk of rotting in Ukrainian silos, and the problem could worsen with the harvest, which is set for next month. Much to discuss, then, with Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Secretary of State, George Eustace, who joins me now. I understand the Prime Minister will be addressing this, I think, later today. Um, what can be done? What do we imagine needs to be done to try and unblock this Secretary of State? Good morning. Good morning. And look, it is a big challenge because um, Ukraine is a significant agricultural producer. And there are a lot of North African countries that uh, depend on Ukraine for importing uh, much of their wheat in particular. So there are two things that we're trying to address at, at G7. One is there are currently around 25 million tonnes of uh, grain, mainly wheat in store uh, in Ukraine from last year's harvest. They haven't been able to get out, that out through the Black Sea because obviously it's, it's a treacherous environment for shipping. Uh, there's a lot of mines uh, that are in, in that uh, area at the moment. And Ukraine themselves, for security reasons, have had to close the, the port at Odessa. And so one of the things that we're looking at is whether... Uh, we could give more support to Ukraine to help them uh, get uh, this crop, uh, this, this stock of, of wheat uh, out into the world market by rail. And that would re require us to support them to uh, to help them with the funding to, to repair some of those rail lines. That's one area. And the second thing is globally, we're arguing that we should temporarily reduce the amount of maize and wheat that goes into biofuels. And that's the, you know, when people see E10 on their petrol pumps, that's that's suggesting around 10% of that is is from crops like um, uh, wheat or maize rather than oil out of the ground. Temporarily re reduce that so that we can have a, a temporary increase in the supply of maize in particular, but also wheat on the world markets. Um, I note, though, that that apparently has not gone down with initial optimism, though, Secretary of State. Are you aware of that? We are aware of that, and we always knew that the United States, you know, would be more sceptical about this, and that's because they're very heavily invested in biofuels, and it's they see it as a significant part of their petrol supply uh, in the United States. So it was always going to be more challenging to get them to do it, but we still think it's the right thing to do, and we do think that we could, you know, reduce the percentage of uh, biofuels going into petrol <clears throat> without having a significant impact on that supply, but, but make sure that we get some uh, food supplies on those world markets too. So we've got a, quite a long way to go to persuade the Americans of this. Uh, that's without doubt, but we do think it's the right thing to do. So it's the right thing for us to argue for. What needs to emerge from Bavaria so the G7 isn't just viewed as a talking shop on these matters? What definitive action would you like to see, Secretary of State? Well, look, we've we've obviously set out the the agenda that we have, and obviously the the big focus of G7 this year is going to be uh, undoubtedly on the situation in in Ukraine, uh, and we think we need to to focus on making sure that we can stabilise world food markets, and therefore those those two objectives that we've got, making some progress on a temporary reduction of biofuels and seeing if we can support Ukraine so that they can get the transport infrastructure to get the wheat out. That's the, the big focus for us. It's always the case with G7 that you have a communique at the end. Sometimes it means uh, more and it's more specific than in other years. Um, last year, for instance, we had some quite specific, quite good text on uh, on net zero and uh, uh, climate change and, and other environmental objectives. And we'll see what comes out of this this year, but, but we think it's obviously a a very uncertain time for the world, and it's important that G7 plays that leadership role. All right. While I've had the benefit of you on the line, a couple of other matters. It is reported that while um, the big dog, while Boris Johnson is away, there are moves by some Conservative MPs to possibly defect. One newspaper today, the Daily Mirror, reports Labour saying there could be at least half a dozen Conservative, your Conservative colleagues, ready to defect to secure Starmer's party. Are you aware of these revolting Conservatives? Uh, I haven't heard that, no. And uh, but often the case, uh, it's often the case with defections that you don't 
really know about it until it happens. I'd be surprised if if the Daily Mirror um, uh, were to know that, and and who knows, it could just be a bit of a, a tittle tattle coming from somebody on the Labour benches, or it may be more real. But look, for me, um, we've got some really big challenges that we're wrestling with as we come out of the pandemic: pressure on the cost of living, uh, a global security crisis with the the war on Ukraine at the moment, a, a backlog on the NHS because they've been preoccupied with COVID, and we've got to sort of get the support to them. There's there's a lot for this government to be getting on with, uh, without us being, you know distracted by uh, such tittle-tattle or even indeed, you know, navel-gazing about leadership right. contests and so on. We've just got to get on with the, the task in hand. W- would you be distracted, though, about the results you suffered, the Conservative Party suffered last week? Surely you need to take action on that. Well, look, they were incredibly disappointing results. There's no getting getting away from that. Um, and, and obviously... What it shows to me is is between now and the next election, that's two years to go, we've really got to, to work to address some of the challenges we've we've got around the uh, pressure on inflation at the moment, uh, the, the issues around the NHS as we come out of the pandemic, but also deliver some of the things we said we were going to do in the manifesto. We've got two years to, to get uh, things back on track, uh, and that's what we're going to focus on doing. And if we can do that, you know, in a year, 18 months' time, things right. could look and feel very different. What might your reaction be were a Qatari businessman to offer you three million euros in carrier bags for a charity of your choice, Secretary of State? Well, look, I know this is obviously a a reference to the news that we've seen about uh, uh, Prince Charles and and this donation. My understanding is, and it's it's obviously one for Clarence House to to deal with, my understanding is that this was uh, immediately passed on to the charity, declared and checked in the usual way. You know, in, in one level, of course, it's it's a bit unusual to have such a large a donation bit, a, in cash. A bit unusual. I don't know the circles uh, very, in which well, you course, move. Well, of course, I'm. Uh, it's unusual, but but on the uh, but on a, on another level, um, if, if if it was a sort of permitted uh, donation that had been checked, um, it, it's still a permitted donation. <laughs> um, it's something that the charity commission, I think, are looking at. But uh, and I uh, I think Clarence House have given an account of uh, their understanding of events, and we really need to to let the charity commissions work carry on and do their do their task. You can't imagine CCHQ taking it, can you, Mr. Eustace? Um, well, look, probably, but obviously, we've got very strict regulations as well on political donations, and mm. they all have to be uh, declared. It's it's um, having said that, um, yeah, there will be up and down the country people running raffles and um, uh, you know cash being used to and, and going into sort of party accounts, uh, provided these things are properly accounted for and lawful. That's that's the key thing. All right. Lastly, there's pressure coming on working from home. Some private employers saying that if it continues. Uh, that they might have to regard view the uh, pay structure of the employees who stay at home. W- what are the level of staff that you've got in the um, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs? What sort of percentage have you got back, do you imagine, Mr Eustace? I, I think... Um Last well, I think the, the vast majority are back some day, uh, some days a week. So we have a, a situation at the moment where people are typically uh, in the office for maybe three days a week, and then they are working uh, from home on the other two days a week. There are some advantages to to the sort of uh, what we discovered through the, the the digital area, where we can I can patch people into discussions and meetings from offices in York or in Bristol far easier than we could and so you get um, uh, that engagement in that discussion and those people are still working but I also think it's crucial that people are in the office for part of the time otherwise you lose that uh, camaraderie you lose um, the the bonding that you you get from a team of people working on something so I think it's crucial that people are in the office but it may be that there are some days when they don't need to be in the office and we we just All need right. to uh, you know we're still finding our way on this slightly different hybrid way of working Grateful for your time as ever. Thank you, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Secretary George Eustace appearing here on LBC. Two minutes before eight is the time. Let's get one last call in on that Roe v. Wade verdict. Andy in Peacehaven. Andy, what do you want to tell us? Good morning. Hi, good morning. Well, my mother got pregnant in 1960, met a guy at a party. Right. Uh, and it was illegal at the time to have an abortion. Right, so right. Gosh. I was born and consequently put into care and straight up for adoption because she had a good job for the British Embassy. Right. These people that keep on about women's rights, this and that, don't I have a right 